I recently read an article in the Australian newspaper by leading demographer Bernard Salt, and it made me think. He posed an interesting question. He asked, Imagine taking an Australian couple from the 1950s and placing them in our society today. What would surprise them most? Bernard Salt wondered, would it be the internet or mobile phones, or our general level of prosperity? Because, boy, has the level of prosperity in Australia changed in that time. He said, maybe it'd be something unremarkable to us, such as the ubiquitous use of plastic. That wasn't around in those days. Or maybe it'd be the idea of wearing outer garments with slogans, brand names, images paraded for the whole world to see. Perhaps it'd be our accent, because we'd be sounding less Australian. Or the pronunciation of some words, which would have a more American twang to them, or even some of the words we use. I mean, the term 24-7 only became popular after the turn of the century, which brought with it alphanumeric concepts like Y2K. Bernard Salt suggested that if the 50s couple were to wander around our CBDs, any of the big capital cities, he was sure they'd be struck by the ethnic mix of people, the cafes, the independence of women, the absence of formal dress, hatless men, gloveless ladies everywhere. And I'm sure he's right. This got me to thinking, what will change in how we live moving forward after the coronavirus pandemic? How is your lifestyle, my lifestyle, going to change? And I know it has in some ways. Now, while this is an interesting academic question, it's also an important question to ask ourselves as property investors, business people or entrepreneurs. So that's the question I'm going to ask today of leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher, who happens to be Bernard Salt's business partner, and I think you're going to find his answers enlightening. So welcome to today's show. Welcome to the Michael Yardney Podcast, where twice each week you will learn a number of new ideas regarding success, property investment, and money in around 30 minutes. Our show is brought to you by Metropole, who specialize in helping you grow, protect, and pass on your wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. Now, here's your host, Michael Yardney, Australia's authority in wealth creation through property, who has been voted one of Australia's top 50 most influential thought leaders. As we move through 2021, we're still getting regular reminders that even though life is getting more normal, the effects of coronavirus are going to be with us for a long time. And so while some people are looking back in the rear vision mirror to see what lessons we can learn to give us guidance for what's ahead, I'd rather look forward into the future. And that's what I'm going to do today with my chat with leading demographer Simon Kirstenmacher. You probably know Simon now as a regular guest on this podcast. He's a director of research at the Demographics Group. He's a columnist in a number of uh, publications and a regular guest here, but he's globally recognized as a rising star in the field of data management and insights. Welcome, Simon. Oh, it's great to be back, Michael. Now, I know you and your team have been having a look at changing customer preferences, how people are going to be doing things moving forward. So I think our chat today is going to be very useful for not just property investors, but business people and professionals as well. So what are the big trends that you're seeing moving forward? Well, we first uh, need to start thinking about the changing customer behaviors by thinking about the big lasting impact that a lockdown mm -hmm. might have had on the way that we do things. Mm -hmm. And in Australia, that immediately raises the question, will people in Melbourne who have been locked down for a long time uh, be changing their consumer preferences in a different way than people maybe in, in Queensland, who have not been uh, under a lockdown for so long. And this would be a really interesting observation because so far we can really talk about the Australian consumer market being somewhat coherent. That might split a bit more. But so we need to be a bit more careful about how we think about our, our market in the future. But the big trend, of course, is that in lockdowns, you are moving inwards rather than moving outwards. Before the lockdown, we socialized outside the home. We exercised outside the home. We worked and we got educated outside the home. And all of a sudden, this is potentially changing. And we are now more moving inwards. Simon, it's not only that. We actually used to shop 
and do retailing outside the home. We're doing it more internally now, aren't we? Oh, absolutely. See, this is me almost forgetting the big one. We've, of course, seen over the last decade or so an increase in the retail spending that occurred online. We started with around 4% in the early uh, 2010s of, of sales happening online, and that number slowly crept up to around 10% just before the pandemic hit. And in the year that we were in, under lockdown in Australia, um, we would have expected this number to go up to right around 11%. But COVID hit. We did all the shopping online and the share of retail that happened online all of a sudden doubled up to 20% during the highest uh, phases of the of the lockdowns. It by now dropped back down to right around 14, 15%. But we can probably say that while the lockdown changed customer behavior in a way that we are seeing more online sales, the shift towards online is not as extreme as we saw it at the early stages of the of the lockdown. Nonetheless, online becomes more important for any business that you're operating. So is it that we now want to get out again? We've had enough being locked down, so we're wanting to go to the shopping centres, we're wanting to go to the neighbourhood. Is that one of the trends? Exactly. Of course, you you want to do the things that you couldn't do, that you were missing out during lockdown. On the other hand, you also created new habits online. So maybe people that haven't purchased certain items online you know, don't go to your local supermarket, have it home delivered. So maybe if you really appreciate the convenience of this online shift, you might stick with it. And we will see certain of those shifts stick over time. It's a it's a guess at the moment how big the order of magnitude will be uh, that those shifts are having. So what are we buying? What are we doing differently well, the first shift, if you if you look at the data, you know, what kind of retail sectors grew quite a lot, you immediately see that Australians uh, spent about 25% more on liquor, just retail liquor sales. And you go, oh, God, is this the Australian way how we deal with the lockdown? We just, you know, we just get drunk. But it's really not that. We actually don't drink more in lockdown than we've done before. This is simply a shift of alcohol spending that would have usually occurred in the hospitality sector, in your local bars and restaurants that is now occurring through Dan Murphy's, essentially. Um, so that's just a shift in, in channel rather than a consumption shift. The really interesting bits where we see retail going up by gigantic proportions, usually over a year, if we compare um, January data for 2021 with January 2020 data, we'd only expect shifts of maybe 2 or 3%. And all of a sudden, we saw, for example, recreational goods uh, rise by 30%. We saw furniture, houseware, flooring go up by around 20%. And we saw hardware, garden materials grow up by 20%. These are growth numbers that are just outside of something that anyone could have potentially dreamt up. And all of those big growth categories really point to Australians embellishing the family home. We could almost talk about the fortification of the family home. We realized that our obsession with home ownership in Australia got supercharged because we spent more time at home it carries an even larger importance in an everyday Australian life, and our spending shows this. Interesting. And did it vary from state to state? Yes, very much so. One of the big differences is that, of course, Victoria is lagging behind in sales. So we only have data up to January 2020 at the moment. And we 21. do uh, 2021, sorry, exactly. I'm still obsessed with 2020. And so we see that the other states saw even larger increases in especially stuff like uh, furniture, mattresses, just homewares, these big ticket items that you don't buy online. You'd rather lie on the mattress in the store for a little bit. You'd rather have a feel of the leather couch, especially if it's an expensive purchase that you make in the store. And so Australians except Victorians already uh, have done this and Victorians are now catching up. By now, they might have caught up since we are right now in March. Well, a lot of it has to do with the savings. Australians stashed their cash last year. 
being cautious, being uncertain of what the future would hold. And now at the peak, household savings grew 22%. In other words, 22 cents of every dollar we earned, we were saving. That's now being spent. And it's being spent on us. I think we feel we deserve it. And it's being spent on cars and it's being spent uh, on property. But it's also doing up your home, isn't it? Very much so. And it's an understanding an almost social issue that we need to talk about here because the Australians that could amp up their saving was, of course, let's call it the upper half of the workforce, people in stable jobs, people who didn't lose their job, people whose income didn't decline too heavily over the pandemic. So it is really the high spenders that could amp up their savings, which is why, for example, the Home Builder Grant that the government uh, announced, which was criticized for, uh, you know, this is just the rich folks being able to have their, uh, their home renovations being subsidized. Well, that is, of course, true to a certain extent. But most importantly, it put the middle skilled, middle income, middle class workers that are building all the uh, all the cupboards, all the kitchen cabinets uh, in Australian homes that build that put all the extensions to the homes, they are being kept in business through this grant. So in a weird way, while this grant is, of course, subsidizing a nice to have for the well-to-do, it is amping up employment for the people that really struggled during the pandemic. And that was the aim of it, and it's actually done pretty well. So, Simon, major events like this don't just change the way we view the world, but it seems like it's also changing the way We want our home to look moving forward. Oh, absolutely. If you look at the Australian home, the standard Australian home that we live in today, we already see marks left behind from previous major changes in history. Remember back in the 1950s, Australians essentially lived in small little English houses. And then you had this big wave of migrants from the Mediterranean, Greeks and Italians, Maltese, come to Australia and they looked at the English houses and said to the Australians, what are you doing? You live in a Mediterranean climate. Why aren't you living in a Mediterranean house? And by the way, also better start drinking coffee and start consuming olive oil while we're at it. But what in the way the the house changed, we added the alfresco. We created outdoor, indoor living spaces where you could move around. We added more veggie patches to the houses. All of this is is a legacy from the Mediterranean migrant wave. And then, of course, over a decade ago, we had the millennial drought. And people people put water tanks into their house. They are still there. They're still being used. They wouldn't have been added to the homes if we hadn't had the drought. And so now the question begs to be answered of how COVID will change the Australian home. I'd argue that one of the major changes will be more storage room. We just realized that maybe if there's a couple of shortage of pasta, (laughs) tomato sauce, toilet paper, we want a bit of additional storage space. So we will be adding this to the home. We exercised at home. So maybe we need to make sure that our garages can make room for gym equipment, for exercise equipment. Maybe we need to make sure that the garages of the new homes are actually high enough for people to skip rope in to do an overhead dumbbell press in their gym, uh, in their, well, gym, in their garage. Yeah. And of course, the big one, homes need Zoom rooms. Homes need a separate study with a door uh, that you can close to keep the kids and the cats out of your business meetings. That'll be that'll be a must. I'm, I'm scanning uh, the room for your cat <laughs> at the you're, moment. You're looking in the background because <laughs> last time round Harley or Bentley came in as well. So yes, the world has changed in many ways, and I think it's now going to be a hybrid model of how people are working. So while people still are going to be going to the office, almost everybody I know is looking at doing things slightly differently and. Even dress code seems to have changed. People are less formal post-COVID. Very much so. Back in the day, uh, I think at Australian conferences, at Australian business meetings, it was a no-brainer to wear a tie. I think COVID might have been the the death of the tie in in, in Australia. I'm not quite sure how this will uh, play out in high finance, for example, but I do see a casualization of, of the workforce is actually occurring. 
It's also like in many other areas, it's just brought forward trends, sped up some trends that were there. And one of the trends is actually larger houses. That's been happening over time anyway, but now it's in many ways a necessity. Exactly. So just from a from a work perspective, we added the Zoom room. And then if you talk about the average home that is being uh, searched in Australia, we now, of course, see the millennial generation looking for houses. This is the generation that right now is trying to start families. So they need bigger homes anyways, just because of the life stage that they find themselves in. So we have the natural demographic shift occurring. And at the same time, we have the workforce shift occurring towards more remote um, working arrangements. So it's it's this double whammy that all drives the need for larger homes. All this beautiful um, and kind of cutesy bit uh, or news that, that happened a couple of years ago with tiny homes. You've all seen the videos of those lovely, cute little trailers where people minimalize uh, and downsize their lifestyles. That might be still the case for a small fraction of the population, but the game is on the other side of town where we need larger homes. And if you can, as a property investor, provide sizable homes in attractive locations, you will have a wonderful decade ahead of you because it is right around a decade from now uh, that millennials will need those big homes. And where are they going to want to live? Most of them are still going to want to live in the capital cities, I believe, Simon. So while there is a slight trend to moving to regional Australia, when you look at the latest Australian Bureau of Statistics, you see it's actually the other way around. Not many more people have actually moved to regional Australia. What's happened, partly because of lockdown and uh, because of border restrictions, people who move out of regional Australia haven't moved to the capital cities. So the net Growth has increased in regional Australia, but it's been in many ways a fact that uh, those who would normally want to move haven't been able to. Just go to any Saturday auction and you'll see the line of people who still want to live in our big capital cities. Oh, absolutely. And this will not slow down. So I think I said it before, anybody who's hoping for a bargain on a three plus bedroom family sized home is going to be very disappointed. Now, we've spoken before about the different income groups in Australia, what your education means to your long-term income, and the skill levels, the five levels of skill that uh, ABS uh, ranks us in. Does this make a difference to some of these trends you're talking about? Oh, very much so. Very much so. Just in order to get uh, some people up to speed on this, what we've seen over the last decades in Australia was a hollowing out on the work of the Australian workforce, where we see fewer and fewer middle class, middle income workers and more and more high income and more and more low income workers, so that the workforce looks like a letter U. What we've seen during the pandemic is that we lost jobs in net terms in all but the very highest income or, or skill level. So it means those jobs that could transition to working from home to to remote work they were safe they even grew their employment base in in total numbers but everyone else suffered so it is really at the moment if you are wanting to target the safest consumer market out there it is the top end of the market the other end of the market is struggling a bit more and is especially now shifting towards watching their money a bit more carefully so you need to have an attractive uh, offering for the lower income uh, half of the population to essentially spend their money. With regard to property, that was made easy. So first home buyers were given huge incentives, stamp duty incentives, home builder, uh, other incentives to get into the market. So this cycle started with the lower end, the middle end and the high end of the property markets all doing much the same, regional Australia, capital cities, other than the inner city apartment markets. And we know the reasons why they're suffering with huge rental vacancies and property prices dropping a bit. But Simon, what we're noticing and the data is showing now is that it's really the top end of the market that's pulling ahead. That's normally what starts property cycles. This time around, it's been a bit different. But those who have kept their jobs, have had multiple streams of income, have stashed their cash and are not spending it overseas, are either buying themselves a bigger home, upgrading, taking the opportunity to do that, or buying themselves a holiday home. Absolutely. The the top end of the market uh, has been doing extremely well. 
and even but it's not just the top uh, you know fat cats that we're talking about we're talking about a broad share of the australian population that is doing really well and that is competing for the attractive homes in the you know middle middle suburbs if you will and that really puts the pressure of course on the lower income people the people that struggled at the moment that still are adding families to australia that are starting families so where are they going to buy they are going to buy wherever they can afford and that is going to be increasingly the outer suburbs yes because the rich don't like to commute do they <laughs> now in previous chats you showed us that your research suggesting that moving forward our population is not going to grow as fast we had a business plan in australia to have 30 million people by 2030 and you were the first one that i heard say that it's only going to be about 29 million now others have caught up with your research but i guess that's what you do all day so that's why you're a front runner and a thought leader in this but even so if you think about it there's still three and a half million people who haven't got a foothold in the property market either as a tenant or as a owner occupier so anyone who takes advantage of the current opportunities even if they seem high and expensive you're still going to be way ahead of three and a half million other people that that's a really lovely way of, of putting it michael you're correct uh, we are still operating a big growth country over the 2020s. And there's no reason that this should slow down. We will be seeing international migration kick back into gear as soon as international travel is somewhat feasible. And you know, just to make another broad prediction, I'm thinking that there will be special travel allowances, uh, regulations for you know vaccinated people coming online very soon. There will be big discussions whether this is socially fair, but in Australia, we rely too much on international travel. Our big businesses with the airlines need all the support that we can give them because they're just such a vital part of the economy uh, that I do see no way around this. But it must need to be packaged uh, and advertised very carefully because it can be political poison. So I don't want to be the poor uh, soul who has to announce this to a, to a vicious <laughs> press. Now, another factor, of course, is immigration has slowed down, as we started to say, but only recently, previous uh, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd came out and said the importance of a big Australia. I think both sides of politics understand it's going to be important to have a big workforce, to be able to pay for the taxes and to actually uh, grow our economy, even if it's just per capita growth, because we've got a bit of catching up to do. Absolutely. And if we open up the big Australia debate topic here, we need to remember that as long as growth is occurring at the same rate as infrastructure is being added, as housing is being added, Australia can add plenty more people. Of course, we also do need to look at, you know, water management for the new population. But assuming that we can tackle all of those issues, this is not an, an idea of ah, this is bad for the environment of adding people, simply because globally speaking, the population is not changing whether they live in Australia or whether they uh, live in their country of birth, if we talk about the migration mm -hmm. issue. So we can potentially even do a net benefit, even just from a CO2 perspective, if we get people out of uh, highly polluting countries into a cleaner Australia, if you will. Yeah, Simon, I love it monthly chats because I know that demographics is going to determine our destiny and that's one of the reasons I've invited you as a special guest speaker at Wealth Retreat on the Gold Coast that we're going to be holding from the 12th to the 16th of June and uh, I know that you're putting something together very special to help the attendees there it's a level above this and you've got this fantastic research department behind you to give people an insight of what's going to happen in property in our lives, in our community, and for the many business people that are going to be coming to the Gold Coast as well. Oh, absolutely, because I do think there is so much to uh, just be aware of from a data perspective. All of those uh, big picture trends that we actually know or can take for certain almost into the future. You don't want to miss out on the big picture information if you make a small picture decision of which property should I buy, for example. 
Sure. So the big picture is going to be helped by Simon Kirstenmacher, Pete Wargent, Dr. Andrew Wilson is going to give us a big picture. So while Wealth Retreat isn't really a property seminar, it's actually about you. It's my exclusive retreat for helping you achieve bigger things in your life to design the next five years of your life. If you're interested in finding out more about Wealth Retreat, go to wealthretreat.com.au. Hey, you can't book in. You've actually got to have a chat with me to make sure that it would suit you. But it's going to be a great opportunity to network, to mastermind, to rub shoulders with some already very successful business people, entrepreneurs and investors. And I'm actually looking forward to getting to know you and your family better. And I know there'll be people listening to this who are going to enjoy uh, getting to know us together better, having breakfast, lunch and dinner together for five days. So thank you for your time again today, Simon. Look forward to our regular chat again real soon. Fantastic. Catch you soon, Michael. In a moment, I'm going to share my mindset message with you. I'm going to tell you the importance of the one thing. What is the one thing? You'll find out in just a moment. But before I do, I just want to continue on a comment I was making a moment ago when I was having a chat with Simon about Wealth Retreat 2021 on the Gold Coast. See, we've been running Wealth Retreat since 2006. We missed out last year because of COVID, but we've booked the room. And this year, when you attend... You'll spend five days, five intense days with Dr. Andrew Wilson, Simon Kirstenmacher, Ken Race, Pete Wargent, a host of property, tax, finance, share market experts. If you're in business, you'll love the time with Mark Creedon, my business coach, and with me too. And we're going to be in a small group environment, so we're going to help you plan the next five years of your life. It's not a property seminar. We'd spend a lot of time talking about property during the breaks and during the seminar, but it's actually about you. It's my exclusive retreat designed for anyone who wants to accomplish bigger things in their life. It's for people who maybe hit some stumbling blocks in 2020 and want to make a big shift to take advantage of the new property, the economic and the business opportunities that are arising in front of our eyes. So if this sounds like you, whether it's for your property investment that you want to go to the next level, your business, your entrepreneurial endeavours, I'd love to help you make your dreams come true because you're going to get my personal insights, my personal feedback on your plans. You're going to receive elite mentorship. It's going to help you take your life to the next level. There are no excuses this year. This is the beginning of a new property cycle. So take advantage of it. Go to wealthretreat.com.au. Find out all about it. There'll be a link in the show notes. But when you go to wealthretreat.com.au, leave your details because I'm going to chat with everyone who wants to come one-on-one. I'll be having a quick chat to make sure it actually works for you. It's suitable for you. And for many people, it's over a long weekend on June the 12th to the 16th, so you won't even miss much work. So let's together plan to make the next five years of your life the best five years of your life. Now here's Michael's mindset message. Remember, a change in your thinking will lead to a change in your life. In my mindset message today, I'd like to discuss with you the one thing that could make a huge impact on your life, on your future, on your financial future. Now, you may be familiar with this. This It's a concept that I've got to give credit to for Gary Keller, who wrote an epic book called The One Thing. The essence is captured in what Keller calls the focusing question. Keller argues that the key to extraordinary success is focusing daily on the one thing. The thing that's most important to achieving a goal, rather than scattering yourself in many directions. Keller explains how to determine your goal or your life purpose, and then focus intensely on getting there. In other words, avoid the pitfalls such as multitasking, relying on prioritized to-do lists, thinking too small, misunderstanding, willpower and discipline, and neglecting your personal life. Keller says that when you know and focus exclusively on the most important thing every day, everything else falls into place. Extraordinary focus on the one thing brings extraordinary success, according to Keller. And that makes sense, but I want to show you something different today. I'd like to ask you to consider the inverse of Keller's question. What's the one thing you do not do so that by not doing it, everything else ends up being more difficult or forever stays on your personal to-do list? Now, that's scary, right? 
Sometimes we only look at what it costs to do something, and then when it seems too hard, we just don't do it. But when you turn it around and look at what it costs not to do something, we may find the price and the pain of inaction can be even worse. Now, I'm not sure what that would mean for you. Maybe it's being stuck in a job trading time for money. Maybe it's not having sufficient choices in life because you don't have passive income coming in because you haven't invested in property. Remember, you're never going to become rich if your money doesn't work for you while you're asleep. Or maybe it's just the frustration, the regret or the envy for those who do have those choices and the passive income and have more. When you prioritize so you're focusing on the right thing at the moment, everything after that subsequently seems to fall into place like a progression of dominoes. When you pursue your goal by starting with the one thing, the right thing, it leads to bigger things. You build energy. It's a geometric progression. To achieve success, I'm going to suggest you aim for the moon. Getting there is doable when you create that domino effect in your life. You see, a wealthy person doesn't become wealthy in a day. A champion athlete doesn't start winning on day one. Money, skills, expertise and accomplishment, they're built over time. Success builds on success sequentially as you move from one thing to another until you reach the highest level possible. So work out what the one thing is you should be focusing on, but just as importantly, think about what the cost is to you, your family, if you don't do the one thing. Well, as we come to the end of another show, I'd like to say thank you for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney podcast. By the way, if you don't subscribe, please do. And if you don't catch me in between these regular shows, there's lots of opportunity. You can go to social media, just look for Michael Yardney, or you can join the private Facebook group. Just look on Facebook for the Property Update private Facebook group, where every day I leave some exclusive content that you're not going to find anywhere else. Now, if you got benefit from today's show, tell somebody about it because that's our way, your and my way of helping pass the message forward to help more people become financially independent. I'll be back again real soon, twice a week. In the meantime, have a great week. Make it a great week. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Michael Yardney Podcast, which was brought to you by Metropole, who help their clients grow, protect, and pass on their wealth through strategic property and wealth advice. If you like what you heard and don't already subscribe, you'll find us on iTunes or on your favorite Android app as the Michael Yardney Podcast. Watch out for our next show, which comes to you twice a week, and you'll learn some new ideas about property investment, success, and money in around 30 minutes. To get more of Michael's thoughts, go across to www.propertyupdate.com.au and sign up for his daily morning briefing and you'll hear from not only Michael, but a group of leading property success and money experts. And just a reminder that the information you heard in this show today is general educational advice and not specific investment advice, as we don't know your personal circumstances. If you're looking for specific advice, why not ask the team at Metropole to help you?